I grew up in Barrington, Rhode Island. I was born in Providence, Rhode Island uh, in 1941. That was where the hospital was. Barrington was a suburban, um, very beautiful up, upper middle class Republican town with a nice main street and elm trees and a little, at the time, it, it, at the time it was fields and a river and a very idyllic uh, memory of it because it was just before post-war baby development of houses and track houses and all the fields. I mean, I grew up playing in fields, and I continued to play in house foundations and was finally shut out of the houses by the time I was 12, because the houses were lived in then. So that was a big shock uh, for me as a kid, I think. And um, where I would have, uh, you know, where I probably would have been exposed to images of the future, and they were minimal, but um, Life magazine came every Friday, and that was a big exciting thing to look at before going to dancing school, I remember, because it was, um, well, first of all, pictorial and great pictures. And I, I, you know, I, the only thing that would come to mind is a kind of soulless Sears and Roebuck, futuristic Studebaker, Tin Woodman look. I, just, I think of the Tin Woodman because I think of the of the robot, or, or, you know, the the, the 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 future being as robot-like. Without the, the future, the images of the future never had any uh, juice to me. Um, th thinking back to it, uh, and they had no funk, they had no edge, that no, there was no shadow, and I think that that's what um, has always frightened me about America, is the kind of denial of the shadow or the dark side. And although it's playing all the time. Uh, in the presentation of certainly the politicians, with the exception perhaps of Kennedy, um, everyone has that smiley face. And I would always felt that the images of the future were like that smiley face. They were not things that I paid attention to. The things that I did pay attention to, images of the future, on television, we got a television, I didn't have a TV until I was 11, so around that time, or I'd be seeing a neighbor's television, would be those films of the... Um, <clears throat> of the uh, atom bomb test sites in uh, outside uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, watching those houses be blown away. Just, you know, exploding, being wiped away by the, uh, the wind from the bomb, heat. And those were incredible. Of course, they, they produced fear. So th there was a big element of fear for me ar around future, you know, m m more so. And maybe I was, you know, finding my own shadow more so than uh, might be presented in the image. And then there was uh, enormous amounts of 50 films of these science out of control, which was, uh, you know, endless tomatoes and blobs uh, that were, you know, growing in, in a cancerous, they're like, you know, devouring tumors. And so uh, those were always, uh, you know, not engaging. And I don't think that I, I had a real struggle myself, embracing the future. I think I really dragged because of the fear of the future. Um, I, I am not, you know, I'm not a stupid person, and I, I was told that I was slow. You know, I, I had problem reading. They didn't, they didn't diagnose the fact that I was, um, you know, I had learning disabilities, mildly dyslexic, and couldn't scan well or, or phrase, or read whole phrases. And so they just said he's slow. And uh, I think that part of my slowness was my fear of going into the future, of growing up, of going into that world that was waiting for me. And I can remember I failed seventh grade, and then I went away to boarding school and had to repeat ninth grade because I had failed ninth grade algebra and they wanted to put me in a college course so I had to take French again, so I had to start all over again twice. So I, I was 20 when I got out of, out of boarding school. And I can remember my mother driving me up to this particular boarding school in Maine. And <clears throat> We, we didn't talk about much. It was a long drive, three or four hours. Uh, and we got there, and the principal said, um, well, uh, I, I see th from your report card that you're, not, you're failing almost everything in school. What, what's the problem? Why aren't you doing well? And I hadn't even been thinking about this. Just out, out of me came this uh, statement. I said, well, since they have invented the hydrogen bomb, there is no future. Not only with all the Beethoven... All of his symphonies disappear forever, but anything I might do would have little effect. It wouldn't exist in the face of that. And the principal took a long pause and he said, 
Well, that's what they said when they invented the crossbow. You know, and I knew there was a difference. And the hydrogen bomb and the crossbow, but I was too intimidated to tell him and what, what I thought the difference was. And they sent me home, and they refused to uh, admit me. And my father said, this is really a disaster, because you're going to end up going into the Navy. That's your only future. So there, there was my future, the Navy, which didn't seem all that bad at the time. White suit, you know, traveling around the world to different ports. And he said, this is going to be, you know, this is a big watershed. He didn't say watershed, but this is a big event in your life. And we, I'm going to write the principal again and ask him if we'll re-interview you, Can you, if your attitude changes, you know. And I went back up and pl played, a, you know, I guess I was frightened enough about the future, about my future. I suppose my father put the fear into me, and I said, yes, I'll buckle down, I'll do whatever is necessary. And I did, and I did. I started to uh, get good grades. I got into a little trouble in Boston once with uh, drinking Petri Port wine with a friend, and all, was almost expelled because we didn't make it back to school on time. But uh, otherwise, I really uh, worked hard. So what was I working hard for? There was a chance that people would be living underground because my next door neighbor, Kenny Mason, built a bomb shelter. He built his own bomb shelter. I remember that now. And I, it was a kind of, I'm trying, it was a kind of pit that he dug out and put, um, uh, you know, some. It was mainly uh, soil, but some like um, lumber that we stole or he stole from one of, or borrowed from one of the houses that were being constructed in the area and put on the top. And it was uh, like going into a cave, but it was his bomb shelter. It was really scary. Again, it was very claustrophobic. It was like being buried alive. So I don't think I could ever, you know, entertain that. But you know, I grew up, uh, so I was born in 41, so I was growing up right at the end of the war. And we had that early on, before the, the bomb, because we had uh, practice air raids. And my grandmother was uh, a volunteer, and she would set off um, the air raid. Uh, Siren and I'd go up with her and I remember them putting cotton in my ears, so I must have been, uh, you know, three, and um, and also all of us being in the bedroom, which was real cozy, with a big blue quilt hung over the window to prevent any light from getting out because they were really expecting a Luftwaffe to bomb the factories in Providence. I mean, they were preparing for that, and so to grow up with that, um, although the fear was not as real as it might be as an adult, because I couldn't comprehend it, or walking along the beach um, in Sakana, Rhode Island, and finding um, German torpedoes washed ashore, you know, all rusting torpedoes after the war, and hearing the guns, or the bunkers going off down there, practicing. So uh, having grown up with that, the coming into the uh, duck and cover uh, time of uh, bomb shelters and rehearsing, although I don't ever remember doing that in school. But oh, I do remember one thing happening, though, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that was, um, I was at Emerson College at the time, and I had been threatening to my teachers and to everyone to run away to New Hampshire and camp out in the woods. And I, I really didn't have the tent or the wherewithal to do it or the fortitude and was distrusting that this nuclear uh, missile crisis wouldn't happen. And then I was um, in a class, uh, English class, uh, literature class, and a big blasting horn started. Boop, 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 like just an air raid signal. And I remember being seized with such a panic. I couldn't breathe, running out of the classroom just like a, a rat in a maze. But, but, and I went right for the water fountain. I remember I had to get a drink of water. I thought I was going to pass out. I thought, this is it. You know, and no one else was, you know, uh, I heard the girls were running out of the dorm screaming, I don't want to die a virgin, but I don't know if someone made that story up or not. But it was a tugboat in the middle of Charles River, probably some wise guy captain doing this. But everyone was so on edge then, and it was just one of the most terrifying moments that I can remember uh, around that, uh, the reality of that uh, crisis. You have kids now. I do. So you must your 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 prospects of the future must change. You know what uh, the, the the concern for the children. Uh, then you start looking. At, then I start looking into the future, and I had a real disturbing um, look at, at uh, the future uh, just yesterday. Strangely enough, coincidentally. Um, um, 
we moved out to Sag Harbor, Long Island, uh, thinking that um, we were, I thought that I was finally returning to a kind of Graceland, a, a graceful place that I had grown up in Rhode Island, and I was going to move back to the sea with the children where we wouldn't have to lock the doors. They could walk to school or ride their bikes like I did. And so I'm returned to that and being close to the sea and sailing my little boat. We get out there and we begin to discover that um, the water probably is not drinkable because of a combination of potato farms, years of potato farming, and golf courses. So the, uh, and the aquifer is, is, is quite chemical. So we're drinking bottled water, which I never thought I would do in the future. You know, I'd always think I would be drinking tap water and, or well water and always thinking that would be clear. Then um, we find out that Brookhaven um, uh, Nuclear Industries is built over the aquifer there. And then last night we went to a new organization called STAR that is a stand-up uh, for truth about, um, about radiation. And in this meeting, um, it was really to discuss the fact that Millstone too has reopened in Connecticut, which is a nuclear power plant right in Waterford. Now, everyone in Long Island has, just thinks in terms of Connecticut's over there, and that's a separate state. The point is, it, it, with the prevailing northwestern wind, it can blow anything across 15 miles, and it's deadly. And it's been shut down a number of times, and they started... There was a guy there speaking that was a whistleblower that was fired because he was a whistleblower, and he's saying, that plant is not safe. He cried. He cried when he was talking to us. It was genuine. It was not any uh, political thing, and he was... Uh, really down on the uh, NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that says because of money, again, and because of big bucks, there's enormous amounts of shoddy overlooking of these problems. So I came home last night. I, did, I didn't sleep. And because of the children. I'm 57 now. And if there was, if I survived any fallout from, from any kind of mild meltdown, already they're polluting the bay, the fish, because of the affluent, the water, radioactive water, partially radioactive, but the children and around cancer clusters and the idea of that in that area between the water that's coming out of the shower and, and the air that's being blown over from Millstone too. <laughs> I didn't sleep last night. And I was, you know, you, you, you fight it, yeah. You could spend a life, another um, 10 years doing that. Or you look for a cleaner area. And of course they say to you right away, well, you're not going to find that easily in America because you'd be amazed how many different pollutants you're dealing with. But I started lying, I was lying in bed fantasizing about, you know, western, northwestern Massachusetts. And that has to do with the children, of course. That has to do with thinking of their future life. And probably that's the, I've come into fatherhood really late, so that is the, that, that is new for me. I tell you, the, the thing that I got interested in in the 60s, really, I saw the future as, as a plague and the past as, as, as somewhat as a plague, but it was my way of making a living. So I'm a little caught in the past because I recycle. I'm a storyteller that tells stories from my life. So I'm very dependent on recycling the past. What I really have to keep clear is I've always been interested in the 60s, uh, uh, since the 60s, in what one might call the eternal present. Can I talk to you where you're at? Yeah. Uh, when, when is it in the 60s? That, I mean, how did you sense well, it? no, no. When I say 60s, of course, I mean early 70s uh, for me because I fled from the um, what, I, what I would call the exploration of consciousness, the movement of psychedelics that was starting at Harvard. And I graduated from Emerson College in 1965 in Boston. And I can remember the last week I was at college before I went off to seek my fortune, fame and fortune in theater, which I was completely dedicated to. All I'd been doing was plays in college, uh, reading plays. I was into theater absurd and Beckett and, and was very fulfilled by it. I directed the Pinter's Caretaker as my final project, a directing major I was. And then this guy came up to me the last week of school and said he'd gone over to Cambridge, to Harvard, and someone had given him a pill. And he literally, his body turned into a child's, his hands was like a child, and I'm just going, whoa, get thee behind me, Satan, you know, what's this guy talking about? I don't want anything to do with this kind of craziness, because uh, that was 1965, and my mother was starting to break down. Um, Kennedy had been shot, the war was happening, I mean, a lot, there was a lot of darkness in the air, and a lot of, you know, like, you know, putting on the blinders for me about what's my future going to be. My future is going to be dedicated to theater where I will play someone else 
other than myself. I will have that escape, uh, that fiction. I will live in a fantasy, in a dream. You know, that was the idea, to be on stage with the lights where you couldn't see the audience. Everything's changed since then. But that was kind of where I was aimed for, which was a kind of shutting down, putting on the blinders. So for me, the 60s didn't catch up with me until the early 70s when I started, when I, actually when I fir first took my first LSD trip, which was quite late in life for me. I guess I was uh, uh, 29 or, or 30 years old, which I, you know, think was good for me that, that it came then. And in a very protected situation, someone who was, someone who was taking it as a holy Eucharist to try to get, you know, in touch with Jesus. So he was just really, he was Jesus freak, but he was working in our theater company. We went up to the mountains, the Shawangunk Mountains up in New Paltz. And I was able to go off on my own and not be, you know, not be in any way brainwashed by him. I escaped him in some way. And I had what, what I would call, you know, a very, very strong um, mystical sense of being very much in the present, or the, you know, and in, in a way that I, I, I had never experienced before. Uh, and uh, in, in, in a way that was not about um, desire. I mean, often good sex would put me in the present, but I'd be desiring that. I, I didn't know what the LSD was or would do, so I wasn't desiring it. It was just completely, uh, 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 the first trip was a, a sense of grace. Then I got interested in meditation and trying to figure out how to digest all of that, and I got real interested in, in Zen for a while and went away to one of these Zen retreats to do a, se a really brutal seven-day session sitting up in the Catskills, and that was, um, that was strong. That was probably 70, 1972, so take on seven days like that. And it was really painful and boring, and I was in the past, in the future, more in the past, in the future uh, not, not as much. And then there was this one split second, which, you know, they might call big mind or the eternal present, in which um, there was a unity. There was unity consciousness in which um, I was, the room and myself and everyone breathing together were, were not separate. There was uh, no, no ego. Uh, but within that, there was the observer, because I'm telling you about it. So the observer, which I am loaded with because I am essentially a writer by nature, although I think I started as an observer and then figured out what to do with it. You know, I was always outside of myself a little bit. Jumped in and tried to, you know, have the experience, saying, oh, I want that. You know, I want to analyze that. I want to think about that. I want to get off on it. And it never came back again. So, but, but it was very powerful. And, and, and I think it, it stayed with me as an ideal that might someday be accomplished. The older I get, the less I, the more I feel it slipping away. But I do believe that, you know, Thinking too much about the future or the past is escaping from the only thing we have, which is the present. So it's a devilish thing. Okay, okay. Shiny aluminum houses of nature right. and this nuclear fear. Well, those pictures, and I am conjuring them up as you tell them to me because I do remember them. They were, you know, they, they reminded me of a future uh, uh, Ozzie and Harriet in the sense that everyone was on the verge of going to work and we never knew exactly what they do we didn't know what the future job would be like for instance the future job is now come to pass it's selling information whatever that means it's computers and i suppose they were starting then in the 50s but the pictures were always again in no way engaging for me i was never read, i never read comic books i was never interested in science fiction because it was, there was a sterility there. There was a lack of spirit and a lack of soul in the fact that the people were like um, automatons in the sense that, all right, say, say you have a flying car, you know, that, that flies to work. And say um, that the gadgets are, you know, in, in the, the, the wife is in the kitchen and she has every possible, uh, you know, ro robot uh, working for what's left. I mean, I know when I, I, I can, the last time I was so turned on by something it was downhill skiing i started downhill skiing and got the best skis at 50 51 52 years old i just started downhill skiing i thought i have gone to paradise this is the greatest thing i never expected this happened to me this this will never be boring and it has become boring and i've had to fight through the bottom and force myself to go back to the slope it's going to happen with everything. And I, knew, I think I knew that at an early age. A flying car is going to just be a flying car after a while because it won't be in contrast to walking. It won't, it won't, it won't it just everyone will be doing this future thing and they will still be dissatisfied because 
Um, objects are a substitution for love. I mean, I, we ne I, never see the, I never see the juice in the pictures, back to the juice, you know. I would see the kids sitting upright, dustless, um, no, no blacks, no ethnic people. I mean, it was just a kind of white robot, uninteresting race. I cannot recall any image when I think back to magazines of, you know, monorails going through futuristic cities that were, would draw me and say, oh, I want to be there. Um, I could see myself being more drawn to the past, images of the past, because they are betrayed more vividly in, in photographs and in writing because the people have um, experienced them, that they're not a fantasy. I remember Sputnik going over the house. I remember I was at my grandmother's house, over, or staying overnight, my parents were away, and going out in her backyard, and seeing that thing go across, and I, man, I guess I just, I just thought, claustrophobia, you know, just, it was a beautiful thing to watch, it was incomprehensible at the time, but I, I couldn't, picture myself being contained in a coffin, like what, you know, what is sent up. I don't mean the Sputnik, but I mean the rockets that were being sent up and the exploration. And um, I suppose that I would, if, if I was, you know, interested in something, it would be the money that's invested in um, searching for radio signals further out. Because I, it, it, in our, in our, Earth time, not even lifetime. In, in the history of the Earth, I, I really wonder how appropriate it would be with with a starvation overpopulation. And I've I've always felt that the only thing that's ever going to unite the Earth, which will never happen, you know, in, in a brotherhood and sisterhood of some sort of harmonious unit that isn't fascism, would be an asteroid that was coming toward the Earth. Um, you know two or three weeks out or a month out. So it'd be a brotherhood and sisterhood of fear. That would be the only thing that caused us to unite and look out, because that would be the God, the God of fear. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to happen. So I think it would be inappropriate to spend a lot of money trying to send uh, humans uh, to Mars, although it's also exciting. It's a double-edged sword. I'm drawn both ways. But I would be more interested in whatever that organization is that is um, committed to looking for um, civilizations much further than we could reach. Because I, I, that's a curiosity to me, the business of us feeling alone. And that's part of why the brotherhood and sisterhood of fear exists, uh, too, because of the loneliness uh, of it. You know, no, no one is overseeing us. I was just looking at a book by, I think it's Bill McGibbon, called Missing Information. And it's about, and, and I want to say one of the reasons that I picked up the book was because Wired Magazine, Wired Magazine, which is a really techno computer futuristic magazine, has asked me to be one of their guest speakers at a big um, media party that they're having in Los Angeles in November. And I'm thinking, well, what could I talk about? Because I, I can't even read Wired Magazine. I don't even type. I'm, I'm not even a conscious Luddite. I'm an unconscious Luddite. I write uh, outlines with pencils. I, I, I don't have a TV. We don't have a television in our home. You know, we have a, 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 a we don't, we have a monitor. I, I suppose there's a, a computer there because Kathy works on that or a word processor or whatever it is, but I, I don't. And so I was trying to think, what can I talk about for Wired? Because I had, um, you know, I had gone to a virtual reality conference, which is supposed to be, there's the future, you know, virtual reality. It was, uh, you know, sim simulators, and I went with Timothy Leary. Dr. Timothy Leary invited me to go to Pasadena. And um, just before I went to the virtual reality conference, um, someone flew me out to Santa Catalina Island um, and was kind enough to come and pick me up, and uh, Tony Bill, and when we were flying back in Tony Bill's plane, he said, now you, take the controls. 
And he turned the wheel over to me, and I was uh, flying the plane. He said, you got the death grip, Spalding. You got the death grip. Relax. We were going over LAX, and 747s are uh, taking off under us. He says, just stay at 2300 because we have some planes taken. I'm like that. And this was a very, very close. I didn't land the plane, but it was a very exciting uh, uh, experience. And one day later, I'm in Pasadena at this virtual reality conference. And um, French television was there, and they wanted to interview me because they, they put me in front line for all the stuff you know, to get my take on it. And um, then they interviewed me, and it was the only um, lukewarm, non-enthusiastic interview in the place, because for me, I had just experienced the reality of flying a plane. And for me, the virtual setup, and I know it has a long way to go, was, um, you know, uh, very uh, virtual, very virtual, very unreal, very simulated, like, you know, playing flight simulators or video games, which I also don't do. Now, that leads me back to the McGibbon book. And what the name of it is, is Missing Information. And it is talking about, and it's a juxtaposition between him watching 98 cable stations in Fairfax, Virginia for a week, and then going up to his mountaintop in the Adirondacks for a week, and observing what's around him and being in that slow living process. A real, a more real, uh, in my opinion, a more, more, more tactile situation. And he started talking about missing information. So if you have now, and he referred to it as the Jimmy Dean Instant Hamburger, I think was the name of it. Whatever it is, I haven't seen it, but it's a hamburger that probably you blow up, I don't know, guaranteed E. coli free. But it is an absolute quick fix hamburger, quicker than McDonald's, and you could purchase it at the store. And then he makes a juxtaposition in the next chapter of what would you do if you were living in the 18th century and you were a farmer, which many people were then, you were working the land, what would it take to get a hamburger? And he goes into, you'd have to till the soil so that the beef cattle could feed from that grass, and then you'd have to kill your own uh, beef cattle, and then you'd have to grind the meat, and you'd have to make a hamburger. So there's enormous amounts of process in there, and enormous amounts of information and knowledge and contact, and being in the world, being in the world. And um, one thing that I think about the future, uh, uh, that, that has hum come to pass, and was probably in many of the, the pictures, is this disconnection or virtualness in which it appeared in many of the future images that people were trying to get away from the world, go out into outer space, go replace people with robots. I mean, oh, oh, cash machines. All I can think of was I'm getting cash out of a cash machine now is, where have all the tellers gone? Long time passing. You know, I hear this song. Where have all the telephone operators go? You know? I'm asking for information about a florist shop. I know the little florist shop in Sag Harbor. It's the only one on Main Street. And I'm out of town. I want to send Kathy flowers, so I'm just calling information. I say, you know the shop on Main Street, the florist shop? I just need the number at Sag Harbor. She goes, I'm in Phoenix. You know, what can I do for you? I mean, she's in Phoenix with no windows. How, you know, boop, boop, boop. So I'm feeling more and more removed. John Perry Barlow, friend of mine, very futuristic man, head of the Electronic Frontier, one of the, one of the heads, big computer man, very big, John. He's in town. He's Mr. Virtual Reality. He's on the road all the time. He happens to be in New York. He'd so love to say, lie, lay eyes on me. So I come over. He's got a, 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 two cell phones, like fist phone. He calls them fist phones in either hand. He's got two big screens here, computer screens. So he's relating to me across the screens while I'm on the couch, you know, just playing at the computer while he's talking to me. He gets a telephone call on one of his fist phones. And it's uh, people from uh, Continental Air. They want to do an interview for Continental Air magazine, for the plane, in, in plane magazine. Uh, who should they contact? He goes, well, let's start with Spuddy Gray, because he's sitting right across from me. He could talk about me. And they say, well, how do we get in touch with him? What's his phone number? And Bala says, just a minute. And gives it out. And I think, my god, there it is. I mean, I'm sitting across the room. There would be a chance, even though it's numbers, to have a little contact if he said, hey, buddy, what's your phone number? They just wanted to show me how computer, and everyone, how computer literate was. L literate he was. And that's fine. I'm not judging it, but I, I am. I am. I am. I'm saying there's a disconnection. I'm saying that when I die, I don't expect to go to outer space. I mean, I don't think, this is, I don't think uh, in terms of a spirit world, is ethereal floating out there. I think that I return to the Earth. I'm made up of the Earth's elements. I'm made up of physical matter. I am, you know, all of that stuff that goes back into the Earth. Interesting, because you go back to like, Le Corbusier, these, these uh, architects, 
and they built they wanted to raise the cities build these super highways yeah. that would separate the cars and then you have uh, you have uh, planes and you have metal uh, metal houses and nuclear cars all of these things are separating from, from mm -hmm. Valley. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that? Um, well I moved to a small town Sag Harbor Long Island and um, this, with the exception of the nuclear reactor over in Connecticut, it pleases me because the town is completely uh, contained. I can walk to it. I, I live right at the edge of it. And don't, I, my idea was to get to a place where I didn't have to motorize. I think that the most interesting thing that's happening with future travel is, is um, the battery operated car. And I'm, I'm just amazed that. Uh, uh, or, or, or these cars that run on uh, methane or, you know, different kinds of gas, but I'm amazed that people aren't simply being, you know, assassinated by, by the corporate world. Um, the business about the, the city being elevated, you know, back to that, I, I don't, uh, you know, my problem with New York City, and it's the one city that I've related to for 30 years, I've lived here for 30 years, is always been, uh, although it's attractive, is the the high rises, and once you get up in um, the 40th floor of ICM or what have you, um, you really have that above it all feeling. And I've always preferred living downtown with the buildings are no more than four stories high. I'm really interested in scale and human scale and walking. And downtowns, you know, I, to walk in Los Angeles, I mean, you can do it, but you'd be totally alone, and the scale is ludicrous. I mean, it doesn't, it feels like you're not getting anywhere. The you're moving in sludge. And here in New York City, when you're walking with everyone on the street and it's integrated, uh, you, you, you are, it's a great joy. Why do you think there is this obsession with, with individual tra transport? You know? I think, and this is an old story about the individual obsession with individual transportation. It's the American story. It's the American individual. It's, you know, non-communist. <laughs> you know, anti-communism because uh, my my good vision of the future would have been and is still um, you know very clean monorails you know uh, mass transportation that is done creatively and because there isn't any underneath American consciousness of that because of the individual covered wagon right on down and the rugged individualist and I own my own gun and my own car and <clears throat> because of that, then, you know, we don't have any decent trains. A Amtrak is not, uh, it's antiquated, it's not futuristic. I think they're trying to do something with a, with a fast track up to Boston, but um, they're just uh, impossible to ride in there. There's no air, they're not on time. And uh, so my vision, I suppose, thinking back, would have been, and still is, to have a good mass transportation system, which isn't happening. And I think the, you know, it, the individual thing certainly comes out of the American consciousness. Um, around the late 60s, early 70s, there was these, uh, this change in kind of films in Hollywood. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but Charlton Heston came in Planet of the Apes, where humans were damaging their world. And these movies show the future as like overpopulated greenhouse yeah. effect. Uh, Biological Warfare, Omega Man, you know, all on down, Blade Runner, all of these things. The, do you have any sense of why that ha happened about that time and why people are fascinated with that now? Uh, when, what time was that? That, that was 68, 68, Yeah, that's 70. right, sure. Um, I suppose those films aren't being made now, is it? I, I, I yeah, sure. But I, I think that that was the, uh, the shadow side for the... Um, for the um, with the, the enormous um, positivism and real, um, kind, almost a kind of a naivete of the 60s, uh, as it got later in the 60s, um, they were exploring the shadow of the Manson, um, Charles Manson thing, certainly. We, we explored that when we were working in a theater company, did a, a theater piece based on that. The idea of the commune, the dark side of the commune, because everyone was talking about peace and love, and it was all pushing the image of, 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 the, commu of, of the commune that was, uh, that was harmonious and uh, built making their own clothes and not destroying the environment. And the other side of that was absolutely, you know, the dark side uh, and, and de demonstrated uh, in uh, uh, apocalyptic ways in the Manson commune.
There's one thing that I that I would like to talk about about an actual future um, event that I went through about about something that wasn't discovered and developed yet or was just being developed when I was a child, and that's the television. So this was a real, futuristic, phenomenal, mysterious, great thing. And I first got exposed to it through my next door neighbors because we didn't, for whatever reason, we didn't have one at home until I was 11. So probably at eight and nine, we were watching Howdy Doody next door. And we'd all, everyone would run to the one neighbor that had the one little tube, you know, and we'd watch that one show and maybe a couple of others. But what I, what I grew up with was, uh, was a radio, of course. And um, so on a Saturday, all of us would go to our ne next door neighbors and sit around this big, beautiful tall radio and um, imagine you know we, we would either shut our eyes but we would create and we never talked about it at the time but looking back I realized that radio was an absolute <clears throat> um, stimulator of imagination because we were creating I was creating Ozzie and Harriet's house I knew what it looked like it was an amalgamation of my own fantasies and someone's house down the street I could tell what they look like so I built this whole inner landscape you know this whole thing Long comes television, you know. Uh, it's kind of, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Got you on a roll. Yeah. I can pick it up. I, I, I would create, I, for instance, Ozzy and Harriet, their house, their radio show. I would see the house. It was an amalgamation of my imagination and a house down the road that my, my neighbor lived in, my friend. And then I create pictures of them, and you'd see them moving through with the sound effects, with the whole thing. Now, when 11 years old, when Ozzy and Harriet were on television or whatever they came, I was 11 when I first got our first TV. It was interesting, but I, it stole my imagination. It literalized. So here, here was a future thing that was going to be really, you know, the cat's meow. And I have gone back personally at 57 years old to radio. Now, I'm a great fan of spoken word radio, but not only that, I'm listening to spoken word tapes at night to go to sleep to. Just like I used to listen to the radio to go to sleep when I was a kid, I would have a crystal set with these earphones because my mother forbid all mystery shows. She was an arch Christian scientist and thought it caused bad thinking. You know, of course, her idea of the future was uh, living with Jesus. But it, we, I'd listen to these earphones and fall asleep with a crystal set listening to um, gangbusters and... and, and House of Horrors and, you know, Mystery Theater. So now I'm back to that place. You know, I prefer, you know, and we don't have a television, and the children are watching videos. They can select a video on weekends, they'll watch videos. But at night, they're doing homework, we're hanging out, we, 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 we're just doing stuff as a family. It, it's really important and good. But then I'll get in bed uh, at 10.15, I'm asleep by 10.30 if I'm lucky, and uh, I'll put on a spoken word tape, of which I have tons. You know, readings of short stories, um, Charlton Heston even. Or narrating of great philosophers, if you can imagine that. It's a real arch tape, you know, Charlton Heston talking about Sartre. But um, whatever, you know, I have tons of them. I listen to all of Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses. Donald Donnelly reads 42 hours of it, and I bought the cassettes. You know, I could go back to that any time. And that puts me out and also puts me in my own imagination and takes me back to that time before the future of the TV. Philip Johnson told us that back in the 20s, when he was in his 20s, everyone believed that uh, in utopias, that it was going to be possible. But it seems like now, in the end of the century, people have a tempered feeling about what progress really means. Right. Could you, could you address that at all? I suppose, although I wasn't a part of it, that um, the communal move in the 60s that I talked about earlier before was um, something that we always thought might go as an alternative, you know, that, it, that would hold. 
and uh, it just seemed to be a little, you know, sunspot in 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 the capitalistic culture. I, I think as long as we're in, I mean, everyone talks about us being a democracy, um, but uh, they always leave out capitalistic uh, democracy, which I I think is, um, you know, I mean, the, the the market is much larger than than the, uh, the mar marketing is much larger than any concept of democracy, which is some ideal that marketing operates in. So I think that as long as there is that. Um, the, the idea of not only competing uh, for product and, and, and uh, planned obsolescence and making better products and manipulating product and manipulating advertising, the, and also the opportunity to um, to uh, to hold on to the money, to be greedy, you know, and, and to control it, is is going to always be a, a fly in the ointment of any any kind of um, you know utopian community. So I, I never I never had a vision of it. You know, I, I read about them or I try to read. Or, um, um, Huxley's um, book, uh, Island, I think it was, which, uh, you know, and they're fascinating to read, but again, within that, the, peop the people always had a little sterility to them. There was that boredom. They're saying, wow, well, these people aren't naughty. They have no place to exorcise their Dionysian impulses because they are so pleasurized, they're working so for the common good and so in a place of, uh, of bliss, of timeless bliss, that there, there, there's, there's, there's just there, there never, no, there's no juice in that, you know, and, 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 and ultimately doomed. What, what aspects of, um, of human nature would you, would you take into account first when predicting the future? Well, first of all, thinking about the future now, C Kathy, um, Kathy, who I live with, and, and um, the children were in the kitchen last night when we came home from the meeting about the nuclear plant, and um, w we were just talking about how we, in front of the children, how, how we felt for them, because of it seems like a darker time. The future seems like a darker time to me, and I, maybe my parents are feeling that way in the 50s, but I didn't feel that way growing up as a kid. Um, it didn't feel light either. It felt a little, as I said before, like a dustless um, fantasy uh, dream, Sears and Roebuck Studebaker dream. But now, we, the first thing that we talked about was, uh, you know, overpopulation, which is an idea certainly of the future. And then you start thinking, well, maybe this should be a, a, a nuclear reactor following up or age. You know, you start thinking in a negative way. How are we going to clear these people away? Me being one of them, <laughs> you know, or the children being them. Uh, so that 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 comes to mind. I, I think it's a very and I, I, it's very hard for me to talk because I'm 57 years old and I don't. There's no, the perspective is changing all the time. So I could say, oh, I lived in a good time and it looks dark. I mean, older people are saying that because they're feeling the entropic force of, of old age, which is, you know, has a, a weight to it. And, and you identify that weight with the future, and, 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 and when you're young, you're thinking of the future as lighter, because it doesn't have, uh, it has, doesn't have the same weight in your body. So I'm tempering it with that idea. I look ahead and I think, um, I think also about um, ineffectiveness of, of the medicine now, and, and the new plagues, you know, how a bacteria thinks better than us because it has no morality system. We just ran out. Yeah. I'd love to come back to this and have you. I think of us, the human race, as a glorious accident. And um, I'm ultimately pessimistic, and I don't mean that in a bad way, and I mean it in a realistic way, because I, this glorious accident is ultimately doomed uh, because the sun in time will go out and the earth will uh, uh, collapse on itself and just be a, a, a briquette, a charred briquette floating in space. And uh, there will be no one to remember us and therefore we might as well not have existed. Now, within that, there's a lot of joy to be had. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not about to kill myself. But I also know that it's, as Sartre would say, uh, we are a meaningless passion, or a passion without meaning. So when I think of the future for my children, I was talking about it last night, I think of 
the dark, I think of darker things than I would have when I was a kid. And again, I, I, I may have to do with age, but I think of overpopulation. I think of the new uh, resistant bacteria. Where you know, when we, when polio went down, and that was like that was like a big thing as, for me as a kid, particularly as a Christian scientist, because I had to in, go out and get my own shots. My mother wouldn't you know, condone them. I had to take it on myself. It was a big responsibility. We now, you know, have enormous uh, bacteria, I mean, uh, microbes and bacteria are, um, uh, viruses are, um, don't have a moral system. You know, they're just completely out to get us and they're going to figure out a way and we have to think of another way to stop them and this will happen. Already with the deer tick um, up where I live in the summer in, in north of New York, um, they're trying to give inoculate. I mean, I never thought that in the future I would have to, uh, couldn't walk in the grass in the summer. It's like we're, we're living in um, some weird country up, up there uh, where there's this hostile microscopic bug the size of a grain of pepper that ruins your entire summer. And now it's, um, it's, it's uh, the virus is evolving, so there are forms that uh, that kill you. The man died in Martha's Vineyard this summer when I was down there from barbiosis, and um, so there can't be one shot, just like with AIDS. You know, it's it's a, a multi-headed um, death force, a one shot to cure the deer tick, and all of this, of course, is going to be overcome by science, or it isn't. You know, just like with polio. But um, when I stand here and look at the future, I don't, I have a sense of the planet choking of, of, from the, the, the greenhouse effect, from what I'm really sure does exist, uh, really. I, I know how the weather's changed in my time uh, of global warming and uh, a greenhouse effect and overpopulation. And, and these are all things that when I was growing up in the 50s, it was ro Ike was a rosy guy. President Eisenhower was this like a great androgynous, sexless father figure, just a sweet old uncle that uh, beat the bad guys in the war. And it was a very s relatively simple time. And my, I can see the complexity in my stepdaughter and two sons now at, at a very early age. And I see them growing to be huge from chicken hormones. <laughs> the hormones in the chickens, you know, trying to keep them away from that chicken so they won't be bigger than their dad. But uh, they're already very um, complicated people. They're very, my stepdaughter is 12 and she's more complicated than uh, my mother ever was at 50. Or that I am at 57. So I'm not hey, I'm almost ready to go. I'm almost ready to lay it all down. Not yet because of my family, but uh, it's, I've lived in a, in, a, in a good time, you know, and I was uh, able to uh, avoid the Vietnam War, although I couldn't avoid it. I mean, I didn't have to fight in it. That definitely would have been a bad time. Okay, okay. Great. I knew it, Pat.